welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. ESCOM reported a 20 billion rand loss for 2019 and warned of a similar level of losses for 2020. Terence Screamer joins me to unpack the results and the outlook for the debt-laden utility. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. ESCOM's high debt level is now really biting. Yes, it's at 440 billion rand and rising. We know they're going to add another 46 billion rand this year. 50% uh, of which is basically secured and the outstanding amount would have to be raised. But what that really means is we're seeing a sh fundamental shift now in the costs that, uh, that ESCOM is paying every year from capital expenditure, the old Madupi, Kusili and Gula program, to debt servicing costs. And in uh, 2019, that level was 69 billion and it's going to rise to 84 billion uh, in the current financial year. Now that's, uh, that's fine if you're able to cover it, but if you look at its earnings or its EBITDA, its earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization, it's nowhere near that level. It's more in the 30 billion uh, rand range. So there's a massive gap that's emerging between its uh, debt servicing costs on a yearly basis and uh, what, it's, uh, uh, what it's able to uh, recover th through earnings. It's become clear that ESCOM won't be able to overcome its financial problems through cutting costs and raising revenues alone. Yes, the, the opportunity to raise revenues at the moment seems pretty difficult. Um, one, it doesn't actually have the electricity surplus to, uh, to provide new customers uh, or to find new customers. But even if it did, you know, the economy is flatlining at the moment. Uh, we're seeing very bad growth rates. Uh, we're seeing uh, residents and uh, businesses starting to defect from the ESCOM system, either in the form of rooftop solar or plans to even have a, a larger um, co-generation facilities and uh, also solar and utility scale solar and wind farms in some cases for corporates. So there's some real uh, action in that area. There is a policy lacuna that makes that difficult, especially on the larger level. So everything's sort of capped at the 10 megawatt level, but uh, mining companies are really talking about the 20 to, to 100 megawatt range. So the people are looking at alternatives to ESKIM supply. And uh, then there's the whole issue of uh, municipal non-payment. That's also really becoming a, a big issue. Soweto and municipalities are still not paying. So th uh, th there's on the on the revenue side, th there's it's really a, a, a difficult story, and it's going to be difficult for Eskom to find new customers and customers that are able to pay, or customers that aren't necessarily t uh, taking their electricity for free. So that's a it's a it's a really difficult uh, uh, prognosis on the revenue side, and then on the cost side, I know there's a big focus I think for society that Eskom needs to become much more efficient. Uh, and needs to be uh, incurring its cost prudently. But this is a big fixed cost business mostly, and uh, some of these costs are, are difficult to bring down massively. So there is a target of 77 billion cumulative by 2023, but, um, and th there has been some progress in reducing the costs, but the focus is going to be purely on, it seems, on the procurement side of things, trying to eke out uh, gains uh, here and there from coal or from different consumables uh, to the way money is spent on maintenance, etc. Because uh, a line has been put in the sand by government that no retrenchments should take place, no forced retrenchments should take place at Eskom. Now this is going to be an issue for, uh, for debate in society, I think, uh, given that the, the pain that uh, everyone is experiencing around Eskom and the fact there's been a lot of uh, fiscal support from the government whether there shouldn't be a more assertive uh, look. But on the other hand, it could be a major distraction to be looking at forced retrenchments at a time when Eskom's at crisis. And uh, it's, uh, you know, if we're entering into a strike period or a, a period of industrial unrest, we really saw what that meant in terms of load shedding and the risk to security of supply. So that could be very disruptive. So I think the approach is not to have forced retrenchments, to continue with natural attrition at this rate of about uh, nearly 2,000 people a year leaving the organization, um, which doesn't really move the needle that much. And then, uh, you know, looking at cutting costs on the procurement side. But as your question alluded to, that's not going to be enough. 
to get people, both the, the revenue opportunities are limited, uh, there's cannibalization from alternatives, and the costs are not going to be enough to close that gap that we spoke about between um, the earnings and the, uh, the debt servicing costs. So we've seen that being plugged at the moment by the taxpayer in the form of fiscal transfers, um, 23 billion initially. Now we've had the 59 billion special appropriations bill and we've been told by the president that over the 10 year horizon it's going to be 230 billion of, of fiscal transfers into ESCOM. But again, that's not going to cut it. So there's going to be, have to be a societal discussion around moving ESCOM's tariff to a cost reflective level so that that remaining residual gap of say 40 billion rand a year uh, after the fiscal transfers, after the cost cutting um, and maybe some revenue gains, but that's, look, as I said, looking very unlikely. There's going to have to be some focus on moving that uh, tariff into a cost reflective level and that's going to be a really bitter, I think, battle. And, uh, uh, but until we grasp this nettle, I think uh, the Eskom sustainability issue is going to linger. There has been no news on a final turnaround plan, but there has been some movement with regard to a chief restructuring officer. Yes, I think this is a big frustration for society, especially inside the energy industry, is the pace at which uh, progress is being made on, on finalising the strategy at Eskom. Um, we know that there hasn't been a strategy before, a turnaround strategy p uh, presented to government, but that hasn't been approved. And I think part of the issue is it's a bit of caught before the horse issue. Uh, government wants to have a, a policy framework that it's operating in, so it wants to publish a white paper that defines the sort of uh, transition that ESCOM is going to go through, including the, the, hi the high profile issue of unbundling into generation, transmission and distribution. That white paper isn't prepared yet, but it should be prepared in the, in the next couple of uh, weeks or, or month or so. And uh, that will also help guide the chief restructuring officer, which will be an outside person. Uh, we know it's Freeman Nomvalo that's been appointed from the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants to head up an office that is really, I think, mostly accountable to the National Treasury and to the Department of Public Enterprises. And that, so it won't be a single individual, but an office that will look uh, at, at injecting certain thought, leadership and skills that uh, from outside of Eskom. Um, and almost as the, as the shareholders' uh, sort of eyes and ears into how this restructuring should take place. But you can see that already the immediate focus is not so much the, the, the restructuring of the business. Um, the immediate focus is, is going to be about the restructuring of the debt uh, because that is the burning platform. And although ultimately the restructuring of the business, I think, is, is going to be very important and it's directionally very important for the sustainability of the electricity supply industry beyond this vertically integrated monopoly, which we now know is f totally fundamentally flawed and unsustainable. Um, there's the burning platform is the debt, debt restructuring, and we know there's <coughs> several options on the table, very convoluted options, uh, v v uh, very challenging to understand, but special purpose vehicles and uh, good assets versus bad assets uh, type approach. Uh, that I think the chief restructuring officer and that office surrounding him at the moment is going to have to look at that debt restructuring as a priority so that we have some sort of visibility uh, on that issue. And then once I think that is out the way, I think then the focus will shift to the, the, the reorganization of ESCOM into a, a, into a fit for purpose type uh, utility where there's generation, transmission system operator and, dist uh, and distribution separated, uh, that we'll have much more visibility of where the efficiencies are, uh, or inefficiencies lie and also where the private sector has a role to play. But I think we're still some way off and I think there's growing frustration at the lack of, seeming lack of urgency other than providing the bailout support which is, is, is crucial from government. But in terms of finalising um, some sort of uh, policy framework as well as providing some uh, indication of the end state of what ESCOM is going to look like and what the electricity supply industry is going to look like. And without that, um, it's, it's, it's going to be, and without 
some sort of uh, decisive movement on that. I think there's going to, it's going to be difficult for investment in this space, and we're going to continue to be kicking this can down the road. And uh, you know, Eskom at 20 billion rand loss this year, another 20 billion rand loss next year. This is a really serious issue that has to be uh, dealt with very urgently. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.